Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> We're going to pick back up here towards the end of chapter four, just a couple more topics up to cover. This question here is going to show us a dilution step, also a solution preparation problem where we can work with the unit of molarity. So here we have 25.0 grams of uh, calcium hydroxide being mixed with enough water to yield a one liter solution. So we're being told the information this way here. We're not exactly always adding precisely a liter of water to make the solution. What really matters is what the total solution uh, volume is. So you would put the 25 grams of your compound in a flask and fill it to the one liter mark as that compound's fully dissolving in water to yield the solution volume. Because you want to know the volume of the entire solution that contains the compound and the water that we added. And so we could calculate the concentration of calcium hydroxide when we take this mass here and dissolve it in the liter of water, the brackets are just the molarity of the moles per liter. So we're going to take the 25.0 grams of calcium hydroxide. A lot of times, especially from this point forward in the class, you'll be given a lot of molar masses for compounds so you don't have to necessarily spend time calculating the calcium plus two oxygens plus two hydrogens. So we have the molar mass given to us. And so that would be the conversion from the, the mass into moles of calcium hydroxide for the solute, and then divide by the liter solution volume. And so if we do this math here, we'd have 25 divided by 74.08, and then divide by a liter. So it's 0 0.337 moles per liter. which we can write with capital M to stand for molar, which means moles per liter, moles of that solute per liter of solution. So this is a, the, the molarity of the calcium hydroxide in the solution. But we're not done with the problem yet because then it says we're taking 10 milliliters of this one liter solution. So we're gonna take a small portion of that solution that we just prepared that has this concentration. And we're going to take 10 milliliters of it and then mix it with 10 milliliters of water then we're going to assume the total solution volume is the 10 we start with plus the 75 mils of water that we add because we're told to assume the volumes are additive. And so what we're trying to do is take 10 milliliters of the 0 0.337 molar solution and then add 75.0 milliliters of water to dilute the solution. Now, there's really two ways we can go. One, we can try to use an equation that we may or may not understand. We were getting to that at the very end of lecture. Um, let's come back to that equation in a minute. But let's think about how we can just use the concept of molarity, just moles per, per liter. Like, we can just use what molarity means to try to take the moles of our solute. So let's try to figure out how many moles of calcium hydroxide are in that solution because we're taking that number of moles, keeping it constant, and just dividing by a new volume. So one way we can solve this problem to take the, the concentration, concentration of calcium hydroxide in what we might call the, the final solution, we might call this the initial solution, the initial one we made first, the final one we made after the second dilution, or the, the second part of the problem. And then this here would be, we could take the volume, but I'm going to express it in liters just so I can multiply by the moles per liter. Whenever I'm solving a problem, I probably want to write out more descriptively that this is the moles of calcium hydroxide per liter of solution. Just so I can keep straight, that's why I can take the volume of the solution and divide by the volume of the solution here so that liters of solution cancels. And then if I do that math step first, that's going to calculate the moles of calcium hydroxide in the 10 mil solution. And then to get back to concentration, we want to divide by the total volume of the solution. which is going to be 85 milliliters. So 
So we're just expressing 85 milliliters and liters. So we can express that in moles per liter. So I'm going to take my molarity from the previous step times 0.01 liters and then divide by 0.085 liters. This gives me an answer of 0 0.0397 capital M or moles of calcium hydroxide per liter of that final solution. So it ended up being answer A. But one of the things I want us to think about is that molar unit, that it's moles of the solute, in this case that's moles of calcium hydroxide per liter of solution. That knowing that the capital M, what it corresponds to in moles per liter, moles of what? Moles of the solute, moles of the thing that's dissolved in the water, and then per liter um, of the entire solution. Now, let's think back to the equation for a minute. So we mentioned that there's the equation approach, or you can apply an equation to to get this answer. The equation we might want to apply is if we take the initial molarity times the initial volume, which is what we did here, just we did that by converting the volume to liters. But if we take the initial molarity times the initial volume, that would give us the initial number of moles of the solute. That's precisely what we had done in the math step. And then if we think about taking the final molarity times the final volume, once we do the dilution just by adding water, that we haven't changed the number of moles. That the final number of moles of solute is the same as the initial. So this is true when we're just doing a dilution. Just by adding water, we're not changing the moles of solute. So do you see how MIVI equals N? MFVF equals N, therefore MIVI equals MFVF. So the two molarities times their volumes are equal to each other. And then if we know this equation and know how to use it, know when to apply it, we apply it in problems of dilution, where we're just adding water to a, a solution and changing the concentration. And then we can just take the initial volume. So I could have taken here just 10 milliliters. My initial molarity was 0.337 molar and then set that equal to the unknown final molarity times the final volume, the total volume of the solution, 85 milliliters. And so if you do this math, you still get 0 0.0397. So if we apply this math here in this approach, we get the same answer. So it's not really a different approach. Like sometimes you say there's two ways to solve a problem. I guess this is a second way or an alternate approach but it's the same approach as above. It's just more descriptively with the first attempt, we were just using what molarity is moles per unit volume. And we're just very carefully calculating the moles of solute, changing the total volume, and then working it out. If there's an equation we can use, that works too. There's nothing wrong with using an equation, but sometimes we may not understand where it comes from or what it applies to or how to use it. So if you need to, just go back to the definition of molarity. Molarity is just mole solute per volume of solution. There's a problem we're going to see later on uh, titrations. When we do a titration problem, sounds like dilution, but it's a different problem. It's not going to be solved with this equation. I just want to throw that out here, that this problem and this equation works for dilution problems. It's not going to work for every problem where you see molarities and volumes. Just keep in the back of your mind that if we have a reaction taking place, we're going to have to solve a stoichiometry problem. And so that gets us into the last section of the chapter, which is on solution stoichiometry and some analysis problems, but we're gonna focus on what we can uh, quantify by stoichiometry, and then we're gonna focus on titration problems. There's a subset of problems called chemical analysis. Um, I, I don't think I'll even show you what those problems look like, but if you get into problems that are like analyzing a sample by converting it to some other compound, that's an example of an analysis that we're not going to cover in much detail. But I think by looking at either the problems we do in class, the problems on the practice exams, when those get posted next week, the ones on the daily quizzes, you'll see um, the problems that you're responsible for uh, for the exam or just kind of hitting the solution stoichiometry um, topic. So we know from stoichiometry in chapter three that you can go from grams to moles with a molar mass, very hopefully easy at this point or very memorable, that you can go from grams to moles with a molar mass, and then you can use the coefficients in the reaction to go to uh, moles of the other reactants or products, and then you can use molar masses to go back to moles. 
Well, here in this chapter, we can just use molarity and volumes to go to moles. So in chapter four, we just add the wrinkle or the other um, detail of a problem where if you have, you know, AAQ plus BAQ, where these are water soluble compounds forming, you know, C aqueous plus D aqueous, that all we really need to give you is a molarity and a volume of say A or B, that would tell you the moles of A or B, and it, you can use that to quantify how many moles would be required to react with, react with the other reactant, or how many moles of product you can form. So um, we can solve the exact same type of problems we were solving in chapter three, uh, just using molarity and volume to give us moles. And so let's look at an example that kind of mixes using masses and molar masses, and also the unit of molarity and volumes. So this problem here is asking us to consider uh, the reaction of calcium hydroxide plus nitric acid. So it's asking us for how many, how many grams of calcium hydroxide do we have to add to completely neutralize, to fully react with 25 milliliters of 0 0.750 molar nitric acid. Well, to fully react means we're gonna have to add, for every two moles of nitric acid, we're gonna have to add one mole of calcium hydroxide, because we see the coefficient is two to one. And the products here, if we think about the type of reaction that takes place, this should lead us back to like section 4.3, for acids and bases react to produce salts plus water. So we have the reaction given to us, but we could have predicted the products, we could have balanced the reaction if we had to, so if they didn't give us the reaction here, hopefully we could be able to come up with nitric acid, reacts with calcium hydroxide to produce calcium nitrate plus water and then balancing it out accordingly. Now to solve the stoichiometry problem, I, I hope that we can see that this is really, um, just follows from chapter three pretty closely, where if we wanna figure out the number of grams of calcium hydroxide that we need to react with the 75 mils or excuse me, the 25 mils of the nitric acid. So I'm gonna convert that right away to liters. I converted it, but wrote milliliters. So I'm gonna take 25 milliliters, divide by 1,000 to go to liters, just so that I can multiply this by 0 0.75, I keep writing the wrong thing, 0 0.75, zero, moles of HNO3 per liter. So this is the volume of the HCl solution. So that's why the liters cancel. And if we multiply these two numbers together, we would have the moles of nitric acid initially present. And so then the next step that I can do is I can just use the coefficient for every two moles of nitric acid that are present we need to add one mole of calcium hydroxide to neutralize it. Neutralize is just a fancy word to fully react with the substance. And then one mole of calcium hydroxide has a given molar mass of 74.08 grams. Now, we could have said how many milliliters of like a 1.0 molar calcium hydroxide solution do we need to add, at which point we'd just be doing the, the molarity conversion here. Um, and then we could do also the gram to mole conversion, just like in chapter three, where we're doing and using the molar mass to figure out the number of grams of calcium hydroxide solid we'd have to add to this reaction. Okay, so hopefully we can see here that we're just doing a volume times the molarity give us moles of nitric acid. It's 0.1875 moles of nitric acid. For every two, we need one mole of calcium hydroxide, so dividing by two, and then times 74.08. So I get 6.95 grams. What did I do wrong? Oh, I know, I did, I did 0.25, not 0 0.025. So let me put the right numbers in. I really can't write or enter the right numbers today. All right, there we go, 0. 0.695 grams. Call it 0. 0.694 grams. Okay, so again, looks like a chapter three problem, I think. It just mixes the unit of molarity in here and we can solve the problem 
and apply the stoichiometry problem just like hopefully uh, we, we've gotten used to from chapter three. One other type of problem though that we can solve that relates the same process, that's a titration problem. Have you guys done this in lab yet? Is it next week? The week after? I don't understand, like last semester we were always like, lab was like two weeks ahead of us in lecture, and now like lab's like two weeks behind. Um, it's probably better that way than the alternative. So, uh, but anyway, so a titration problem, this is what we might do if you had um, a container of, you know, say you had a couple gallons of an acid or a base solution, and you weren't sure what the concentration was or you wanted to determine the concentration very precisely, what you might do is take a small portion of that solution and test it through something we call a titration. And so the way titration would work is you're gonna take you know, a certain volume, a known volume of a stock solution. And the idea here is that you're probably testing like a, a large, like you have a large quantity of a substance and you're just taking a small portion. But you have to measure the volume precisely so we see, you know, like a pipette's going to be used here to deliver precisely, in this example, 20.0 milliliters of an acid to a flask. And so we add that acid into a flask. One of the keys, and this is something you'll see in chapter 16 and 17, a little bit more detail of, but you use an indicator that changes color, whether the solution's acidic or basic. And so we're starting acidic, and so we choose an indicator that happens to be clear, an acid solution. So you add the indicator, you don't see any reaction or any change. Uh, but then once you start adding a base solution, so you start dropwise adding the base, the base reacts with the acid. Um, they don't name the acid in here in this example. Let's say it's H2SO4. Then we know that that's going to react with sodium hydroxide to produce Na2SO4. is water soluble plus water and if we balance this out we're going to need two sodium hydroxides to give us two sodiums and then we have two hydroxides two H pluses giving us two waters now as we start the problem as we start dropwise adding the base we're still net acidic you know we have more acid present than base so you can think of this as an excess reactant problem at first where you have an excess of the acid and you're slowly adding the base so the base is your limiting reactant and is completely consumed. These reactions take place really quickly. You can actually see the indicator after a little bit start to turn like the color, the color of the base solution is pink. You'll see a pink color and you can see it dissipate really quickly. That's the base hitting the solution, changing color. And then as it reacts very quickly, it disappears. And so you're just adding dropwise, dropwise, and you're adding it slowly until you reach the point where that color change is just first observed and stays persistent as that base color. That's where you know that's the precise moment where you've added just enough base to reach the fully neutralizing point of the reaction or what we call the end point of the titration. So you reach that end point of the titration, that's where you've fully titrated the acid and you've gone over to being net basic and you can see um, the precise point that tells you the precise stoichiometric point. You've added just the right amount of the hydroxide ion to react with all the H plus ions in the acid. And so then once the solution turns that persistent color, that's our final volume reading. So we're gonna use a burette. So you guys are learning how to use pipettes and burettes. I think that was this week in lab. Um, and so the, the burette, you can see the before, the after, take the difference. So you can see how much of the sodium hydroxide solution was required to be added. And the only kicker would be, you'd have to know the sodium hydroxide solution very precisely to begin with. Now this could start a chain loop of, well, how do you know that? And we could talk about, and I think you'll do this in lab, where you start with something like a solid organic acid. Um, the reason why you do that is you can put it in an oven, dry off all the water, have a nice pure compound that you can take a mass of, and you dissolve that compound in water, and then you know how much acid you have, that's how you standardize your base, we could do an example of that, but I don't have one for the notes, but you'll see that in lab. But that's how you can precisely get what you call a standard solution. That's how you can standardize your base solution so you can know its concentration. And then you can take that base solution once you know its concentration, precisely determine the concentration of an acid. Now, with all, let's just look at the problem, because I think the problem is just a problem. You know, like whether or not you really understand how you're gonna do this in lab is one thing. If we can see how we can analyze the data, um, hopefully we can understand that step, the steps it takes just to work out the answer here. So let's say we're titrating phosphoric acid. So let's say we have 25 mils of a solution of phosphoric acid. 
I think it's helpful to think that you're just testing maybe a small 25 mil portion of a larger container because you're trying to figure out that larger container's concentration. I think it's good to know that's why you would do a titration usually. And so then um, it also helps you understand that you're trying to determine the concentration of H3PO4 in that 20 fill, 25 milliliter portion before that reaction begins. Okay, so we're titrating with 0.125 molar KOH. So somebody before us has figured out how to standardize that solution and standardize it out to 1 point, uh, 0.125 moles KOH per liter of that solution. You do the titration until you reach the end point, so it took 45.4 milliliters of KOH to fully titrate the acid. What is the molarity of that acid solution? So we want to know the molarity of the H3PO4 solution, and so this is going to be like what the molarity of, like what we know that would mean would be the moles of H3PO4 that were initially present. So how many moles of H3PO4 are present in this 25.0 milliliter solution? And then let's convert that to liters. So how many moles of H3PO4 are in the 0.025 liter solution to begin with is ultimately going to be how we solve this problem. So we need to figure out how do we calculate the number of moles of H3PO4 that were in that solution. The way we can figure that out is with um, the idea of solving a stoichiometry problem. So the stoichiometry, the, the acid-base reaction taking place, phosphoric acid reacts with KOH. When it fully reacts with KOH, it's going to lose all three of these H pluses, go all the way to K3PO4. So we're going to form a salt plus water because this is an acid-base reaction. And so we have our salt here and our water. And so we're going to need three KOHs to give us the three potassiums. Remember, phosphate's a three minus. And so then we're going to form three waters. So we're going to take three H pluses, three OH minuses, and end with three waters. And so if we want to throw AQ tags in, we can. The acid and base are AQs. Water is a liquid. So everything but water here is AQ. Now, the reason why we have to right balance this reaction and think about it is because we got to get this coefficient. Like, I have to get this for every one mole of H3PO4, we had to add three moles of KOH. That's the most probably important number in the problem is that three to one ratio. So the moles of H3PO4 like, we know how many moles of KOH we added. If we take the volume of the KOH in liters, so that's the volume of the KOH solution, then I want to take the molarity of that solution, 0.125 moles of KOH per liter of that solution of KOH, so the volume of the KOH solution cancels. I don't know why I'm still in red ink. It's kind of bothering me, but whatever. Um, but th there's only one more step. And it's the easy step to miss. It's the easy step not to understand. But it's the ratio of how much KOH had to be added compared to how much acid was present. It's just this three, for every three moles of KOH that had to be added to the solution meant that there was one mole of H3PO4 present. So it's just the ratio of one mole of H3PO4 reacts with three moles of KOH. So it's just the simple coefficients from the reaction that we had to have known to balance and write and understand and predict the products of and all that good stuff. And so that's how we go from moles of KOH to moles of H3PO4. So if I take 0.0454, and if you want to be careful, and maybe I should just do 450. 45.4 milliliters divided by 1,000, because that's just the conversion to liters. So this is just coming from the volume here, 1,000 mils per liter. Take that times 0.125 moles per liter. My other thought would be, remember when I said when you see problems that have molarities and volumes, you can't just do M1V1 equals M2V2 or MIVI equals MFVF. This problem here has two molarities given, and uh, two volumes given, or excuse me, it has one molarity, two volumes given, so why don't we just plug into that MIVI equals MFVF equation? 
Well, the reason why is that's a dilution equation. We're not diluting the solution. The problem here is a reaction. So because we have a reaction, we got to write and balance and use the coefficients. So we just have to solve this problem like a stoichiometry problem. So 0.0454 liters times 0.125 moles per liter to divide by 3 tells me that I have a solution initially with 0 0.00189 moles of H3PO4 that were initially present. That's how much H3PO4 was there to react with the KOH that was added. You could think of this as a BCA chart. And like if we had infinite time, I would probably very carefully write out a before. This is how many moles we had before of H3PO4. And then the KOH, what did we have before? We had three times that number of moles. And then we were losing X of H3PO4 and three X of KOH, both of them down to zero because we're adding just enough KOH, so we have just enough of it to work with all the H3PO4, so we're precisely adding the right stoichiometry of both, so we really have neither an excess or just a smidge of an excess of the base to see that color change. So as soon as you get rid of acid, you go to neutral, or you go to a slight bit of excess base, you see that color change. That's how these titrations work. I'm hopefully trying to portray some common mistake students make on titrations is a lot of times students will add the two volumes together here. You know, like the reason why we don't add the volumes together is we're not like asking for the concentration of H3PO4 once it's diluted with the KOH solution because once the KOH is added, it's gone. We're trying to figure out what the concentration was in that 25 mil portion before we started. So if we miss the point of the problem, we might make a mistake on what number we divide here by, but we're taking the solution we want to know the concentration of with the moles that were initially present in that solution to get its concentration. So divide by 0 0.025 gives us 0 0.0756, around 0 0.0757 molar. So answer B. But now this would be moles of H3PO4 per liter of that solution. So if you ask me, the only tricky part about titration is that it involves like almost every detail of this chapter. You know, it involves the concept of acids and bases and acid-base reactions and balancing a reaction and predicting products and writing the reaction and understanding the stoichiometry. So the only hard part of this problem is that it involves five topics that are all pretty tricky in and of themselves, but not impossible. And we just have to think about those details, I think. And if we do, I, I hope we can understand this problem, make it to be the simple problem that I think it is. Um, I hope you guys can think that too once you maybe practice it a couple times. But just remember, this is just a stoichiometry problem in the end. It just should have a mole-to-mole -mole conversion. If you're solving a stoichiometry problem, you've got to have somewhere a mole-to-mole -mole conversion and you have to have a balanced reaction. Okay, so hopefully you'll see a lot of examples of titration problems. We tend to give you the reaction. This problem is a little trickier because you had had to have known to write and balance the reaction, how to do so. A lot of times we'll give you the reaction so we're not testing too many concepts in one question. Um, so if you look at a lot of exam questions, they usually will give you the reaction. Um, if they don't give you the reaction, just think about what reaction takes place and try to write and balance it accordingly. Okay, so before we move on to uh, chapter five and get a, a start on that chapter here today, I thought we'd take a little bit of time to review a couple of problems from chapter four. Um, there's probably, I think, eight or so problems at the end of the notes. I'm gonna look at four of them today. We'll look at the other problems for review later uh, in the class. And I also um, found this from, from my version of the textbook from when I was a student, I found this chart. And to be honest, I'm not sure why they took this out of the book. And so I just wanted to use this as kind of a quick review. So this like, was a summary. Um, it was actually presented pretty early in chapter four. I put this up on Carmen, too. Um, it's uh, in the lecture slides if you want to get this PDF. I just put it up this morning. But it says here, like, if you're trying to classify a compound you know that dissolves in water, and you're trying to determine the electrolytic behavior of the compound, what should you consider? And the first thing you might consider is, is the compound ionic? Because if you have an ionic compound, um, if you have something like NaCl, then it's ionic, soluble in water, then it's probably going to be a strong electrolyte. Now, probably why they took this thing out of the book is the word probably is weird. Um, so I don't know why they put the word probably. So I would just say, 
if the compound's ionic, you know it's water soluble, has to be a strong electrolyte. There's no other case for a ionic compound to be anything but a strong electrolyte from anything we've seen in chapter four. And so then the next question would be, if it's not an ionic compound, that must be molecular. Or at least in terms of what we're talking about here in chapter four, if we have a compound dissolves in water, we know it's water soluble, we know it's in the solution. The next question would be, if it's not ionic, we know it's molecular, we might ask, is the compound known to be an acid? The easiest way to think of this question is, do you know how to name the thing as an acid? If you recognize the compound from naming as an acid, then it's an acid of some sort. And then the question would be, is it a strong acid? And so we just have to memorize the seven strong acids. Just remember HCl, Br, I, but not HF. And then HNO3, ClO3, ClO4. So a couple X, so nitric, chloric, perchloric. And then the first H off of H2SO4. And so if it's one of those acids, it's a strong acid, strong electrolyte. And then if it's not one of those acids, then it's a weak acid, weak electrolyte. So this would be, if you know it's an acid, you know how to name it as an acid, it might be acetic acid, carbonic acid, uh, phosphoric acid. So all those other acids would be in the category of weak electrolytes, weak acids. And then if the compound is not an acid, so we're looking at a molecular compound comprised of non-metallic elements, and then it's not one of the acids we know how to name. The next question would it be, is it NH3 or something that looks like NH3? And really just NH3 is our prototype for being a weak base. If it is, it's a weak electrolyte, weak base. And if not, it's probably a non-electrolyte. Uh, and by probably, at this point, we'd mean it's a non-electrolyte. And so what are some examples of non-electrolytes? The key examples that we use a lot would be things like methanol, ethanol other alcohols. So alcohols aren't named something acid. They're not basic either. They don't release hydroxide ion into solution. They don't release H plus ion into solution. They look like maybe they could, but, but they don't. Um, and just to contrast this with the weak electrolyte acetic acid, you can kind of see how CH3COOH looks like an acid, but it's really a special group here where this whole functional group here means that this hydrogen is acidic. And just that one hydrogen, if you recall, Acetic acid is a monoprotic acid, has one H plus it can lose. These hydrogens here, those are staying put. They're not falling off if we add KOH. We add KOH to the solution, one H plus would fall off, but not the other three. So hopefully that gives us a, a, a good little overview and reminder of some of the, the key electrolytic properties of compounds that we see a lot. For the, the next three questions in the notes, I thought, why don't we do these kind of um, on the, the, we haven't done a lecture quiz in a while. So there's lecture quiz four, or, uh, 14, the word for today, I set up a while ago, I'm pretty sure it's ionic. Uh, but do the next three questions in the notes, I'll flip through them just to make sure that you guys are seeing the same question. So there's a little particle diagram, this will be question one, move on to one more review question and get a quick little preview of chapter five. They could work together too if you're not sure.
All right, let's take a look at some of these. And if you're still working, that's fine. Or if you want, it doesn't matter if you submit these, are just for practice and engagement. It's good for me to see the stats kind of, most of you guys are on the right track for the first question here. But sometimes these questions are a little confusing on what we're trying to portray. This is trying to portray that HNO3 would be H plus and NO3 minus in solution 100% because it's a strong electrolyte. So because it's a strong acid, strong electrolyte, it should be dissociated as all H plus ions and nitrate ions separated from each other. So that's why box one would be correct. Um, now, what do the other boxes look like? What might be portrayed? Box two is what you might have if this were a weak acid. So if you just had partial dissociation, that would be box two. Um, box three looks like a non-electrolyte because nothing's ionized here. So if this compound didn't ionize at all in solution, it might look like box three. Um, but of course, HNO3 is a strong electrolyte. Box four is wrong because the, the nitrate ion doesn't fall apart into like nitride and oxide ions. And even if it did, those charges wouldn't make any sense. So the nitrate ion remains intact. Remember, all of the molecular ions that you might know from nomenclature, if you can name the compound, it's going to dissociate to those ions. So to H plus and nitrate ion. Question, the next question in your notes should be a question about electrolytic behavior of some compounds. Do that as question two. Question. For the next question, um, we're seeing more like a 50-50 split on a couple of these, so let's take a look here. So which compounds are strong electrolytes in water? So KOH is a strong electrolyte. It's one of the exceptions for the usually insoluble hydroxide. Acetic acid is a weak electrolyte. It's a weak acid, not one of the seven strong. This one here sometimes confuses people into thinking it's a weak electrolyte. Maybe they think it's a weak base or some kind of base. Um, this thing is a non-electrolyte. So that's a non-electrolyte. And then lead iodide is insoluble in water, so it is not a strong electrolyte. So only compound one here is a strong electrolyte. Let me take a look here. So we're just seeing maybe some guessing on a couple of the answers here for, for the second one, but over half the class is on track for answer D. Um, wait, hold on, what am I looking at? Oh, a lot of people said C, one and four. Lead iodide, definitely insoluble, okay? So we gotta check the solubility chart here to know that that's insoluble, not soluble in water, so it's not going to be a strong electrolyte. So only KOH here is a strong electrolyte. Now, if we wanted to rank, like let's say you could put one, two, and three into solution. Four doesn't go into solution, so it doesn't have a property of a thing in solution. If you wanted to rank one verse two verse three in terms of conductivity or electrolytic nature, compound one's going to have the greatest conductivity because it has the most ions in solution. It's the most electrolytic. Um, three is going to be the least because it doesn't have any ions or very few, if any ions at all in solution because it's a non-electrolyte. Two is a weak electrolyte, so it has some ions. So if you're thinking of electrolytic nature, the conductive nature, solution one would be KOH and water would be the most conductive, acetic acid in the middle, and then methanol at the low end. Just another thought on a question that relates this topic here. And then do a question on weak electrolytes as question three. And then um, we'll take about five minutes for you guys to work on these questions and then review these three. Okay, for the third question, so what's the stats? kind of all over the place here. So which group of compounds here are all weak electrolytes? For some reason, MgOH2 has always gotten students to think it's a weak electrolyte or some kind of weird electrolyte. We would just look at this as being insoluble from the solubility chart. And so being insoluble doesn't allow it to be classified as any kind of electrolyte because it's not in the solution. Um, the other two compounds are weak electrolytes, but we're looking for a category of compounds where everything is a weak electrolyte. We have two strong acids, so those are strong electrolytes. So B is not going to be the correct answer. We have a strong electrolyte, HClO3, because that's a strong acid. So C is not all weak electrolytes. Uh, in the case of D, this looks like the right answer because I have a weak base for ammonia and then two weak acids. I know nitrous acid and phosphoric acid are weak acids, presumably, or only because they're not one of the seven strong, presumably because they're acids, they have to be weak acids. That would be the thought. I know how to name these from chapter two as acids. They're not one of the seven strong. 
So those are weak acids. Now here what we have is a um, weak acid for the first one and then two non-electrolytes. So sugars, alcohols, non-electrolytes. Those aren't ionizing in solution. Let's one question together. Um, consider the reaction of barium hydroxide and potassium carbonate. Uh, can we uh, consider what ions are spectator ions in the reaction? Weird question, but this is really just getting at, can we go from writing a full molecular reaction to the full ionic to a net ionic? Can we cancel out those spectator ions and identify what they are? And so if we're gonna think about this reaction here, in fact, I don't know why this red ink's been bugging me. So we're gonna take uh, barium hydroxide, which is water soluble. It's one of the exceptions for hydroxide ion that's soluble in water. K2CO3 is one of the exceptions for um, carbonate ion. In fact, all alkali cations are soluble in water regardless of the anion. So this is an AQ. Reacts in water. Barium carbonate is insoluble because barium is not one of the exceptions for carbonate ion. And then the other product would be KOH. And then that is water soluble. And so that should be balanced, which is two, the KOHs and everything else is balanced. And so if we want to go to the full molecular, or excuse me, this is the full molecular reaction. And so from the full molecular to the full ionic reaction, what I want to do is just ionize the strong electrolytes. And so I only have three of the four compounds or strong electrolytes. The barium carbonate being insoluble doesn't allow it to be ionized in the solution. So barium hydroxide would be barium two plus, plus two hydroxide ions. I'm gonna leave off the AQ tags from all of these just to save sloppy writing. But the key, this is the key, is that barium carbonate, because it's a solid, isn't ionized in the solution. So it's not in the solution as ions, it's together as an ionic compound, as a precipitate, presumably at the bottom of our uh, reaction mixture. So then I write the 2K plus and the two hydroxide ions. And so then I go looking for the ions that are both ions in the same form on both sides of the reaction. So I come up with K plus, and I come up with hydroxide ion. And so those ions here would be my spectator ions. So the spectator ions would be potassium and hydroxide ions because they're the ions that are unchanged in the reaction. If the problem asks for what's the net ionic equation, the net reaction to the net ionic reaction would be barium two plus, I'll throw the AQ tag in, plus carbonate ion aqueous forms barium carbonate. And that's a solid. So that would be the net ionic if we wanted that. So just kind of a reminder on writing reactions. Okay, got a few minutes left, so let's get a quick little kind of start on chapter five so we can sort of build and start um, hopefully running pretty quickly through chapter five next week. So chapter five is on the, the topic of thermodynamics, uh, which is the heat changes that accompany chemical reactions. So what's gonna go on in chapter five is going to be the topic of, you know, when a chemical reaction takes place, what's the heat associated with the reaction taking place? Does the reaction give heat off? Where Maybe this, if the reaction is taking place in water, the water temperature goes up. So we'll see examples of reaction. We'll pass one around the room where we can dissolve a compound in room temperature water, makes the water temperature increase, become hot. We can also dissolve compounds in water that do the opposite. So we can have a reaction take place where the reaction occurs, something dissolves in water uh, as an example that leads the water temperature to drop. So the heat changes that accompany reactions, we can have reactions take place that give heat off, uh, those we call exothermic reactions. You may have seen that word. We'll define it later. Uh, but then you can also have reactions take place that absorb heat. Those are endothermic reactions. So a reaction that absorbs heat is taking the heat from the solution, dropping its temperature. If you can start to lay the groundwork for that thought, we'll be running with that thought. We'll talk about that more as we continue into chapter five. So a quick little overview here. We're going to talk about the nature of chemical energy early in the chapter. Talk about the first law of thermodynamics, which is that um, energy is neither created or destroyed in reactions. Uh, we'll talk about enthalpy, which is a state function that 
um, is the heat change that accompanies chemical reactions. Uh, whether or not a reaction actually occurs spontaneously, uh, we'll see has nothing to do with whether or not the reaction gives heat off or absorbs heat. So something to think about would be that if a reaction, if you want to predict I have an A goes to B, will this reaction actually occur if I, if I, if I have A, will it turn into B spontaneously? That involves delta G and entropy. We'll see those later in chapter 19, uh, later in 1220. Um, so we'll talk about the heat change here in chapter 5. We'll get into enthalpies of reaction. How we study and determine enthalpies of reaction um, is from calorimetry topics. And then we'll talk about Hess's law, which is we'll see where we can combine reactions and come up with new reactions, enthalpies. And then also look to ways we can tabulate things like enthalpies of reaction. Okay. So a few parts of chemical energy that we might want to talk about is uh, some different equations or thoughts where energy is related. Uh, work is the energy associated with putting an object into motion. So if you put a force on an object to move it some distance, that's um, the energy uh, that we call work. So work is the energy associated with putting an object into motion. Um, not necessarily the equation you have to memorize and use, but just a thought that energy can be used to put an object into motion. Energy can be used to heat an object up. So if we have energy, we can use it to heat up an object. So we can take a certain mass of an object, use the specific heat or know the specific heat, which is the heat it takes to raise a gram of an object by a degree C. So we can heat an object up um, a certain mass by a certain temperature with a certain amount of heat. Uh, we can drop the temperature of a substance if we take heat away. So we have um, heat is an idea of changing the temperature of a substance uh, as a function of its specific heat or its heat capacity. And then we also have uh, an equation we looked at a little bit before. I think we've talked about this equation um, relating the charge or the interaction of charged particles. So we have Coulomb's law that, in, uh, that talks about the attractive force between oppositely charged particles. So oppositely charged particles have an attraction like charged particles would have a repulsion. So if we had two positively charged particles or two negatively charged particles, these are going to repel each other and they're going to try to get as far away from each other as they can. And so two negatively charged particles or two positively charged particles are going to repel. So our next slide kind of shows a, a depiction of the difference between the attractive nature between a, say, positively charged particle, let me switch this, um, between a negative and a positively charged particle. So if you take a negative and a positive particle, bring them together, the energy drops for that system, if you will. So if you think of the, the energy of those two particles, their energy is going to drop as they're brought together because they have that attractive force. So this is describing the attractive force between our um, negative ions and our positive cations. If you think of bringing two positive particles together, they're going to repel each other. If you took two negative particles and try to bring them together, the energy is going to increase for the system as you try to bring those particles together. So in order to bring two like charged particles together, energy would have to be absorbed by the system. Um, if you have two particles that are already brought together that have the same charge, you can release energy by separating them. If you think of the opposite, if you have a negative and a positive, bring them together, energy will be given off, emitted by that process. And then if you then try to separate them, if you have um, like a sodium plus and a chloride ion, it's gonna take energy to separate those particles. So you have to have energy absorbed by that molecule to break the attractive force between those ions. So the first law of thermodynamics is kind of showing us that we can have some initial state, we can have some final state, and the energy can be lost by a given type of reaction. If the energy is lost, it's going to go to the surroundings of the reaction. So you can have a reaction lose energy. I'm starting to feel like I have a, I don't know, that's very chatty today. Making very self-conscious of, <laughs> uh, but anyways, um, we can have the opposite where the energy of the reaction goes up. Um, so other reactions can take place where the reaction has to absorb energy. Where's the energy going to come from? The energy has to come from the surroundings. So the surroundings we're going to see has a direct relationship to reaction. So if, if, if a reaction is going to release heat, the heat that's released is going to go into the surroundings. Uh, imagine a reaction taking place in a cup of water. 
And so uh, you have a compound dissolving. That's a reaction we can picture. You have like calcium hydroxide dissolving in water or some compound dissolving in water. If that reaction releases heat, is the temperature of the water going to go up or down? It's going to go up because the heat that's being released by the reaction is going into the water. So if we have this type of reaction taking place where heat's being released, the temperature of the water is going to go up. And if you have the opposite, we'll see like ammonium nitrate. We'll do an example of this demo on Monday. If you put ammonium nitrate into water, it absorbs heat from the water for that reaction to take place. So if it absorbs heat from the water, the water lost heat, its temperature drops. We saw the combustion of a balloon where we had hydrogen and oxygen in the balloon. We saw the kaboom fireball took place. Um, what we saw was the energy being lost by the reactants turning into the products. Water's more stable. Hydrogen and oxygen are at the top of the hill. The energy that they lost went into that fireball that we saw and heard with our eyes. So you can sort of think that some reactions, if they're explosive in nature, they give off a lot of energy. You can see the fireball. You can tell that energy is being released by the reaction. If you have the opposite type reaction, then energy is going to be absorbed. Um, so you can imagine reactions that do the opposite. Energy has to be absorbed in the process. So just trying to get the idea of heat can be either released or gained by a reaction. And we just are trying to quantify what that heat change is, what its sign is, and what we can learn about it. So